Okay, terrific. Good morning, everyone. Um, and thank you for joining us in the interest of um, uh, making sure that we take advantage of the full hour. I'll go ahead and get the meeting started. Um, I'm Mark Erkin, and it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Trevor Hengel, and who is an assistant professor in the Division of Endocrinology and Diabetes at Keck School of Medicine at the University of Southern California. He is the associate director of the USC Thyroid Center, and he will be presenting um, this morning. And it's an, also a tremendous pleasure um, to introduce Dr. Maria Papaliantio. Um, I apologize if I have not done a great job of pronunciation. Um, who's Assistant Professor of Internal Medicine, Division of, End of Metabolism, Endocrinology, and Diabetes at the University of Michigan. So as has been our protocol, um, we uh, will have um, Trevor uh, present the article and um, then have Maria follow. And anyone who would like to pose questions, we will do our best to get to those. You can just... Um, uh, click on the appropriate icon on the right-hand side of your screen and uh, print or um, just put those questions in and I will do everything I can at the end um, to pose those to our presenters. So with that, um, and I'd like to uh, have Trevor go ahead and get started and um, thanks Trevor. All right, thank you Mark. Uh, so Pleasure to be here, um, and thank you to uh, the people who helped uh, set up the technical side, uh, who I trust will interrupt if anything is going wrong technically on my end. Um, I think we're out in Los Angeles uh, doing well, and amongst the many serious and important hardships, one uh, that is not so important is that it's still been relatively difficult to uh, get a haircut out here in Los Angeles, which I haven't had the chance to go go do yet, so hopefully soon. Um, but to start off today, we wanted to um, give a, a, a question, a poll to everyone about this topic, which I'll go ahead and start with. So for this case presentation, an 81-year-old male presented for management of a single incidentally found thyroid nodule in the left thyroid lobe. The nodule was a solid hypoechoic mass, wider than tall, measuring 31 millimeters in its largest dimension with smooth margins and no microcalcifications. The patient was asymptomatic and had no family history or radiation exposure. No suspicious lymph nodes were identified in the neck. Based on the above results, what would be your next step? One, active surveillance. Two, ultrasound guided FNA biopsy. Three, FNA biopsy with molecular markers. Or four, core needle biopsy. So I can, I can see the results, and I think everybody um, else can as well. And the plan is to return to this same uh, question at the end um, and see uh, how the answers look at that point. So that brings us um, to the topic, which is this paper uh, by Ji Hong Wong et al., um, which I was... Uh, uh, the senior author for the quantitative analysis of the benefits and risk of thyroid nodule evaluation in patients uh, greater than 70 years old uh, in thyroid from 2018. I have no relevant financial uh, relationships for this. And as far as objectives, um, I hope that people will be able to understand the data regarding the evaluation of thyroid nodules and identification of high-risk cancers in this age group, and then to better counsel older patients about the potential risks and benefits of thyroid nodule evaluation and treatment. 
So kind of just to get started is the, the introduction or the background for the topic, you know, what, what is the starting point for this? Well, as we well know, the incidence of thyroid cancer has risen uh, dramatically over the last uh, four, now five decades, you know, raising two and a half uh, fold um, over this time. And this has been studied and commented upon uh, in a number of, of ways, uh, largely uh, the, the overdiagnosis potentially from increased use of imaging modalities. On the right-hand side is a table uh, from a New England Journal study in which the expected thyroid cancer incidence is shown in the lower dotted line and the observed uh, incidence is shown by the shaded hump. Uh, and this is the incidence uh, in women. And what we see here from South Korea, which is sort of a model case where thyroid cancer screening was very common, this Everest size increase in the incidence of thyroid cancer. But in other countries, including the United States, there's uh, certainly analogous figures from this paper. If we look at thyroid nodules um, in this, uh, figure is a number of studies put together by Ernie Mazzaferi quite some time ago, but, but it illustrates the point that if you look at the, the circles, palpable nodules increase with age a bit. But when we use imaging, we can see a very dramatic rise uh, with age in the incidence of thyroid nodules that are identified. And why that might be particularly important is we know that the proportion of people in this age group is, is rising. It's going to continue to rise. Uh, in the upper left, these are uh, the, the global uh, percentage of patients greater than 60. And we also see that from U.S. Census data for adults older than 65, moving into the future, becoming a significantly greater percentage of the population. So point two in the introduction is just a clinical observation. Um, uh, just thinking about actually performing this study itself um, and, and our own experience. Just kind of a mini vignette that I thought of um, was a patient that could be seen who's an 88 year old woman with an incidentally found thyroid nodule on CT imaging, for say a aortic aneurysm. 2.6 centimeter well circumscribed but solid nodule, hyperechoic, um, not otherwise suspicious, but maybe a few little uh, echogenicities in there. And, and what do you do about this? Uh, you know, this patient certainly doesn't want excess interve uh, interventions, but is concerned about uh, cancer, is willing to do what we say is necessary. Uh, what is in this uh, older patient's best interest? I always found that in the clinic, uh, those patients presented a challenge to me. And as far as the general thyroid nodule evaluation, as I'm sure you'll all be familiar, ultrasound has become a key feature in the assessment. Uh, and there are a number of different ways to do this, but what I've shown here is the current American Thyroid Association symptom that involves pattern of, of increasing risk and uh, a uh, approximate risk of malignancy. Uh, and then within this, there are recommendations of when to perform biopsies such that uh, smaller nodules with greater risk are biopsied preferentially, uh, whereas lower risk nodules, uh, biopsy can be deferred until nodules are, potential, are larger or potentially deferred completely. When nodules are performed, they're typically uh, evaluated with FNA using the Bethesda system, uh, which falls into six categories with the approximate malignancy risks here. And downstream of that, we have sort of general uh, management strategies. And on the right, certainly for suspicious and malignant nodules, uh, surgery is most often used. And even for Bethesda 3 and 4, so-called indeterminate nodules, depending on molecular test results, overall clinical evaluation, sonographic evaluation, patient preference, surgery still often is going to be performed. Um, and so the, the percentage of those often result in surgery once you've started the evaluation. 
And we can think of advancing patient age as an important consideration when we're evaluating nodular disease. The guidelines from the American Thyroid Association on Thyroid Nodules, uh, to paraphrase, say that in, when talking about uh, papillary thyroid cancer, that an active surveillance management approach can be considered as an alternative to immediate surgery in patients expected to have a relatively short remaining lifespan and cite cardiopulmonary disease, other non-thyroid malignancies, and very advanced age. But really, there are few data available to specifically guide providers in, in the complexity of the decision uh, and the specific sort of risks and benefits related to nodule evaluation in the older population. And finally, it, in the introduction to this was sort of the conundrum uh, that exists. And for that, I want to just take a moment to look at this previous paper uh, by Nora Kwong and the entire uh, group from Brigham and Women's, which uh, did a study with the aim of looking at patient age and on the formation of nodules, multinodularity, and risk of thyroid cancer. Uh, it looked at over 6,000 patients from the Brigham and Women's Hospital Thyroid uh, Nodule Clinic seen over an approximately 20-year period with an FNA biopsy of a nodule one centimeter or greater, looking at these outcomes, not only malignancy, but also the risk of aggressive disease, which was defined as anaplastic thyroid cancer, medullary thyroid cancer, poorly differentiated thyroid cancer, or any cancer with distant metastases. And so I'm just going to look at uh, the, the cancer uh, part of this study, which this figure showing the prevalence uh, related to categories of patient age by decade. And what we'll see is that the risk of thyroid cancer in a nodule declined with age. However, when looking at the risk of aggressive thyroid cancers, the prevalence certainly increased with age, consistent with uh, what we know, but really demonstrating that while overall older patients have a lower risk of cancer when evaluating their nodule, they're at higher risk for potentially serious disease. And so in thinking about uh, perhaps the conservative strategy, we're confronted with uh, this push and pull uh, in terms of what the, what the benefit and risk might be. And so that led us into conducting this study. So really the purpose of this study was to address these gaps and to be able to facilitate a more informed and personalized discussion with our patients uh, that were at least 70 years old or older. This was a retrospective analysis of the prospectively collected cohort of patients undergoing FNA biopsy at the Brigham Women's Hospital Thyroid Nodule Clinic in Boston, and it covered the time points from 1995 to 2015. As far as the uh, clinical data, the, the clinic uh, performed a consistent diagnostic approach over the vast majority of this time period that involved clinical evaluation, history and physical, ultrasound evaluation to measure nodules in three dimension and look at their solid uh, and cystic proportion, as well as the other features. And then cytology performed using a liquid-based preparation evaluated by expert pathologists and using the Bethesda categories or terminology that, that was very similar to what became the Bethesda categories. And so for this study, the inclusion were patients who were at least 70 years of age and had an FNA for a nodule that was greater than or equal to one centimeter. And we defined significant risk thyroid cancers similar to what you previously saw with ATC, MTC, poorly differentiated, and then differentiated thyroid cancers with distant metastatic disease at the time of evaluation. We also looked at preoperative evidence that suggested this. Um, so if a cytology was positive for one of the defining uh, histologies, 
or if imaging were strongly suggested them. So uh, the, the ultrasound or other imaging uh, really indicated gross invasion, lymph node metastases, or distant metastases. We collected um, from uh, the data patient comorbidities, specifically focusing on uh, what was highlighted in the American Thyroid Association guidelines, coronary artery disease and non-thyroid malignancies. Complications from thyroid intervention uh, were collected, FNA, although that was very rare, and uh, complications from, from thyroidectomy. And then overall survival was the primary outcome looking at the risk of all-cause mortality, which was assessed using Cox proportional hazard regression analysis, and adjusting for the baseline variables, age, sex, and the comorbidities. So moving on into the results of this study, uh, there were 1,129 patients that were from the cohort that were included and the age was uh, a mean of 75.8 years. Looking at the 77% uh, female predominance, uh, that reflects somewhat uh, typically what you would find in a general thyroid nodule uh, population. And then skipping down a bit to patients with multinodular goiter, there were 58%. There were 2,527 nodules, and looking at the median size, that was 1.7, uh, spanning from 1 to 12.5 as the range. And again, an average of 1.7 isn't too uh, desperate from what we would think of in general thyroid nodule populations. Looking at the cases that underwent, uh, uh, for the most part, surgical resection, uh, for which there was histopathology, with a small number being definitive on biopsy but not undergoing resection, 57.3% of those were malignant. Um, and then the different categories of malignancy are shown below, but 78.8% papillary thyroid cancer, um, being the most frequent type, again, not too far off from what might be a, a general population. Although certainly if looking down at anaplastic uh, thyroid carcinoma, certainly a higher percentage that, than you would see if looking at uh, the entire spectrum of age range when evaluating thyroid nodules. So again, seeing that um, uh, slight aggressiveness that is present in the older populations. The next piece of data was the distribution of Bethesda categories um, as the primary cytology and then the six categories on the left-hand side. 67% were benign, uh, which is consistent with what we would think. And the rest of the distribution actually not too uh, far off from what might be encountered generally. The malignancy rate, and I, We'll take just one second. I don't know how loud my air conditioning is, but I don't want it to be bothersome. So I'm just gonna turn it off in the next 30 seconds. The malignancy rates observed on the right-hand side uh, show a very low rate of malignancy in benign cytology um, and, and certainly with malignant uh, diagnosis, a high rate, some of those again being unresected but positive on cytology. And then looking across Bethesda, three, four, and five, 18%, 28%, roughly 60%, again, similar to, to what would be generally found. So um, these um, in older patients seem to reflect uh, our general understanding of biopsy results. But looking at the uh, significant risk thyroid cancers that were observed in this population, there were 17 um, and they're detailed uh, 
here, um, which can, can be looked at. Um, but key to this was how they were identified um, as significant risk. And along the top, there are the aggressive ultrasound findings, specifically the identification of, of lymph node metastases, uh, their cytology, and then one more over the presence of distant metastases at evaluation and their eventual outcome. And what we're able to see if we kind of look at if any one of these was present at thyroid nodule evaluation is that somewhere uh, in this um, most frequently, in almost all cases, there was one of the indications um, of you know, preoperative presence of a significant risk thyroid cancer, either based on the nodule morphology, lymph node metastases, or the presence of distant metastases. Uh, it's a little bit, I didn't highlight it in any sort of box, but if you can see the mouse, I will point out just in the middle, these couple of Bethesda 4 follicular neoplasms um, that were poorly differentiated thyroid cancers. Um, and then looking at the outcome, these patients remained alive. But overall of this group, there was a, a significant um, proportion who were uh, deceased related to their thyroid cancer. So when we took, when we began looking at overall survival, um, we, we, what we wanted to do in this case was to look at the survival of patients who did not have one of these significant risk thyroid cancers. And the first thing to note is that among this group, we did not identify any thyroid cancer related mortalities. So the overall survival um, was not considered to be attributable to their thyroid cancer. But when we looked at patients and, and uh, their comorbidities, we saw significant reductions in the survival probability in patients with comorbidities of coronary artery disease and other malignancy compared to those without this condition. Um, and even stratifying these two, uh, those with both conditions um, had the lowest survival probability. In terms of the hazard ratio in the univariate and multivariate uh, evaluations, um, we have found a small but significant effect of increasing age on survival. No difference in uh, the sex uh, variable in the multivariate analysis, but then again, a strong uh, hazard ratios for comorbidities uh, based on the presence of absence of one or both of these conditions. Finally, um, to just try and provide a, a useful summary, we looked at, at what we thought of as the risks of benefits um, as a number needed to treat for uh, the evaluation of thyroid nodules in this group. So if we look at patients who were found to have a significant risk thyroid cancer, this was one out of every 66 patients evaluated. Uh, the, the number who had thyroidectomy that revealed benign disease was one out of 13. The number of patients uh, who had a complication uh, was one out of 69. Um, and these, uh, just to, to say briefly, were uh, very, very rarely FNA complications and were um, considered those typical of thyroidectomy, transient or permanent uh, parathyroid dysfunction, uh, laryngeal nerve dysfunction, hematoma. And significantly, one out of 17 patients in this age group had died during a follow-up period of five years. Um, but overall, 94% of these were attributable to non-thyroid cancer causes. So if I'm to summarize the data from our study, 
the investigation of nodules in older patients still appears necessary, that obtaining uh, an ultrasound assessment to uh, define nodule morphology and the potential for lymph node disease uh, was important to identifying significant risk uh, thyroid cancers. And even FNA uh, may be necessary um, in those cases because uh, going forward with any necessary treatment, uh, some sort of tissue diagnosis is likely to be needed. In patients without significant thyroid cancers, um, the intervention does come with risks, as we saw a significant proportion undergoing surgery ultimately with benign disease, um, as would be expected, um, but certainly coming with the potential for complications. And then in patients without significant risk thyroid cancers, the cancer mortality was very low, while many had limitations in, the long, in their longevity. The conclusion was really that the discussion of nodule evaluation for older patients can be informed by these data to optimize health value when we're having discussions about uh, optimal care for that 88 or 81-year-old patient um, and, and what their evaluation is. The one other comment I wanted to make going out going back to what I pointed out was uh, you know that those that that a previous study from the same group um, done by uh, Zhao Yun Zhu uh, showed that the proportion of cancers rose from Bethesda three to Bethesda five to six, um, and that those cancers were more aggressive in the higher Bethesda category, with the exception being uh, Bethesda four, in which there was a disproportionate amount of poorly differentiated thyroid cancers. Now, this is the same cohort, but it helped further uh, provide granularity to those data that a couple of those patients were uh, in this uh, a cohort of older patients, as I showed. Um, and so I, I think there is a note of caution in those particular instances, but also to note that those patients, neither one of which had thyroid cancer mortality uh, in this study. So that's my summary of our article, um, and I appreciate very much the opportunity to come and talk about it. Terrific, thanks, Trevor. Um, Maria, um, and if you could uh, go ahead with your discussion, then we'll open this up for questions. Great, so can everybody see my screen? Okay, yes. so um, thank you, Trevor, and I, you know, I'd like to provide some discussion to what Trevor has just mentioned, and also um, hopefully uh, create some food for thought and further discussion in regards to thyroid nodules and their management in older adults. So uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm particularly interested in uh, thyroid disease uh, and aging, so the intersection of that, and also particularly interested in overdiagnosis and overtreatment in this population. So uh, in terms of disclosures, I have grant funding from the NIA and, and then uh, University of Michigan. And then I am associate editor for clinical thyroidology, just uh, like Trevor. So in keeping with my Greek roots, I, I kind of wanted to start with one of my favorite quotes from the father of medicine, Hippocrates. And even though this is an English translation from ancient Greek, I think you can get the point. So the physician must be able to tell the antecedents, know the present and foretell the future must mediate those things and have two special objects in view with regard to disease, namely to do good or to do no harm. So I wanted to reflect a little bit on Trevor's study and talk uh, um, about some of the study's strengths and weaknesses that will also lead to my discussion. So, uh, so definitely this is a study that contributed um, significantly to the thyroid literature. It was a large 
cohort of patients. It definitely provided detailed information on evaluation, treatment, and outcomes for those uh, patients with thyroid nodules that are uh, 70 years old or older. And as Trevor has mentioned, it does provide a guide for counseling and shared decision-making between physicians and patients uh, in regards to thyroid nodule management. However, there were some study limitations, including a relatively short follow-up. So I believe the median follow-up was four years. So even for patients who are, for example, 70 years old, currently those in the United States are expected to live an additional 16 years or so. Um, there is some selection bias. So it's possible the nodules who had more concerning features were more likely to undergo FNA. And the setting for the study was a high volume academic tertiary center. So it's unclear whether results could be generalizable across the nation. Additionally, outcomes of some patients who underwent FNA could have uh, been similar if they were just followed with ultrasound. So something to think about in terms of active surveillance. Um, and then the histopathological diagnosis was not confirmed for all nodules and survival status was limited by use of EMR. So I apologize for some repetition, but as Trevor mentioned as well, uh, these uh, questions are important because of the growing population of older adults in the United States and globally. So on the left here, when you can see a different figure from the United States Census that's often shown by the uh, National Institute on Aging, is we can see the uh, age categories in 1960, uh, both males and females, and then the projections for 2060, so a century later. So it is quite obvious that there is a rapid increase in older adults in the nation. And I put this figure on the right to show you the number of centenarians that is projected in 2050 in the United States to reach uh, almost 1 million compared to just a few thousand back in 1950. And the reason I put that there is to uh, make everybody uh, think a little bit uh, in terms of uh, one of the really rapidly growing populations is really that of the oldest old. So again, similarly, thyroid nodules are common, especially in older adults. And this is a review that was published over a decade ago now, combining several studies that had attempted to uh, determine the prevalence of thyroid nodules in the United States. And some things to think about, it really the prevalence depends on the population studied and also the method of detection. So uh, you can see here that if we were just palpating the neck, fewer than 10% of thyroid nodules would be detected. But with the increasing use of imaging, namely ultrasound, and also results from autopsy studies, the prevalence in some uh, of these studies uh, reaches uh, almost 60%. Um, so thinking about the prevalence of thyroid nodularity by age in this prospective cohort analysis, uh, that also Trevor referred to of 6,391 adults who were aged 20 to 95 years old and presented for thyroid nodule evaluation between 95 and 2011. Um, uh, they were split into six categories that you can see here in the figure on the x-axis. So these different age categories were subsequently compared in terms of sonographic features of their thyroid nodules, cytology, and histological outcomes. So it is clear that there is an increase in thyroid nodularity by age in a linear fashion, with a significant increase of 43% when comparing the 20 to 29-year-olds to those over 70. So I think we can all agree that thyroid nodules do increase with age. On the right axis, you can also uh, uh, see the proportion of patients who had multiple nodules, and those also do increase with age. And I wanted to stay, take a step back and think about those uh, who are considered to be older adults. And this is a study from our group that looked at SEER Medicare data and what the role of thyroid ultrasound as initial imaging was in those 65 years and older. So the cohort was restricted to those 65 years and older, so patients who uh, 
received benefits uh, who were younger than 65 years old due to disabilities, for example, were excluded. And a time trend analysis was done from 2002 to 2013 to determine the rates of thyroid ultrasound use as initial imaging. So thyroid ultrasound was defined as initial imaging. And if there was no other imaging study preceding this ultrasound that captured the thyroid gland, so you can see here a dramatic increase in the use of thyroid ultrasound in older adults with a rate of 21% per year when looking at the years 2002 to 2013. In the same study, uh, a projected thyroid cancer incidence was calculated uh, in two ways. So the lower line, the light gray line shows you what the projected thyroid cancer incidence would have been if the thyroid ultrasound use was set at 2002 levels. And the other line shows what the uh, thyroid cancer incidence uh, is projected to be, was projected to be with actual thyroid uh, ultrasound use between those years. So the SEER Medicare cohort geographically covers about 28% of the US population. So it was projected based on this data that over 6,000 adults aged 65 years and older were diagnosed with thyroid cancer during this decade just because of the increase in the use of thyroid ultrasound. In other words, um, of these 6,000 adults may not have known they had thyroid cancer if thyroid ultrasound use remained steady uh, since to the early 2000s. So I think we can all um, attest to, uh, to this criteria or ultrasound characteristics that we think of that increase our suspicion for malignancy. So I'm not going to go through all of these, but these are characteristics that are used in risk stratification um, algorithms when we think about who uh, to perform an FNA on. So again, uh, I know Trevor mentioned this already. We have two main risk stratification algorithms that are currently in clinical practice based on sonographic features of thyroid nodules. Uh, this is the one from the American Thyroid Association that shows the five different categories depending on sonographic uh, uh, features and categorizing them at different risk levels with an estimated percent of malignancy. And then on the right here uh, are the size cutoffs of the nodule uh, for which FNA is recommended. The other uh, risk stratification uh, algorithm that's out there that's widely used uh, is TIRADS. So it's a system that came out of the American College of Radiology, which uses a point system to come up with a score and then depending on the score or sum of uh, these points, FNA is or is not recommended. And similarly, sonographic features are used to determine these point averages. However, we can all attest that there's limitations of these image-based risk assessment tools. So first of all, there's definitely inter-rater inter variability, and I'll talk to that a little bit later, uh, but also these are sonographic characteristics. So these do not take into account any other patient factors, for example, age and sex. And they, these systems also do not clearly differentiate between higher risk cancers from lower risk cancers. So there's definitely limitations and there's other secondary risk factors that we could be using integrated into these systems to make better decisions in terms of benefit and risk for our older patients. So I wanted to show this uh, because it's pretty remarkable. This is also a study that came out of the University of Michigan Radiology uh, Division, and it was a retrospective single institution study of 1947 thyroid nodules that were consecutively aspirated between 2009 and 2016. So these nodules were this um, the results of the FNAs were reviewed by an independent radiologist who was blinded to the actual cytology. 
And they were categorized in one of those five ATA risk categories that I showed earlier. Subsequently, the group also looked at inter-rater variability. So they had four other independent readers that were also blinded to review these um, results and, and place these nodules in one of the five categories and also comment on presence or absence of microcalcification. Additionally, uh, they uh, also looked at the positive predictive value for each ATA risk category in respect to thyroid cancer. So you can see at the bottom there what the overall inter-rater agreement for ATA score across all five readers was, and it was pretty fair, so not great at all, with an intra-class uh, correlation coefficient of 0.46. So it just kind of demonstrates how much variability there is uh, in the eyes of the beholder. On the other hand, they showed that the ATA system does effectively stratify for thyroid cancer, but you get the indirect harm of detecting uh, a, a higher magnitude of lower risk disease as expected. So when we think about additional patient risk factors that may increase likelihood of thyroid cancer, history of head or neck radiation and family history of thyroid cancer are two of the ones uh, we always incorporate um, in our medical history taking and are mentioned in the guidelines. But more recently, there's data emerging that younger age and male sex, and perhaps other factors we should be considering uh, may need to be considered in decision-making. So this is a study uh, that, uh, a pretty large study of over 34,000 individuals with over 47,000 nodules that looked at different predictors that may independently uh, increase risk for thyroid cancer. This is particularly for papillary thyroid cancer. But what you can see here at the bottom when they looked at age, and you can see the different age categories, and on the y-axis is the papillary thyroid cancer to benign nodular thyroid disease ratio. It is clear that patients younger than 40, around 40, is where you can see that uh, threshold have a higher risk of um, a nodule being cancerous, and uh, also solitary nodules versus multinodular goiter tend to be um, conferring a higher risk in younger individuals. But the risk decreases significantly with older age. Uh, in the same study, male sex was also found to be significantly associated with uh, predicting thyroid cancer in a nodule. What was also interesting about this study, uh, they subsequently conducted another model where they incorporated TSH into the risk prediction model. And similarly to some of the older literature, it was shown that a higher TSH when incorporated into the risk prediction model also independently shows uh, or predicts uh, thyroid cancer risk in a nodule. So what I'm trying to show is that besides imaging characteristics, there's definitely other reasons we should be thinking about or other risk factors we should be thinking about when deciding uh, how to manage thyroid nodules, especially in older adults. And this is, uh, this is going back to the same study that Trevor had talked about, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but basically, again, showing you the decrease of the risk that a thyroid nodule will prove malignant with age, but on the contrary, uh, the proportion of identified malignancies that represent high risk or aggressive disease increasing with older age. So some things to consider when thinking about how to talk to your older patients in terms of thyroid nodule management. So uh, again, as already mentioned, in the American Thyroid Association guidelines, there are some special considerations uh, that are um, to be taken into account, especially for older adults, when we're thinking about active surveillance being appropriate as an alternative to FNA biopsy. So patients who may have very low risk tumors um, based on sonographic evidence may be followed. Patients who are at high surgical risk, and I'll get to that in a minute, 
and patients with a relatively short lifespan expectancy in whom the benefits of intervention may not actually be realized. So uh, I know Trevor mentioned uh, about complications and uh, we all agree that FNA biopsy is safe, but I wanted to, um, to challenge some of the data out there in terms of the safety of thyroid surgery, thyroid cancer surgery in older adults. <laughs> Um, so a lot of the data that is already published is based in um, high volume academic institutions. So the data is taken from high volume uh, academic institutions. And this is a study we conducted a few years ago, uh, looking at a population based sample. So this also you see our Medicare data to determine both uh, general complications, which were within 30 days of surgery, and also thyroid surgery-specific complications, such as hypoparathyroidism or vocal cord paralysis, within a year of surgery. So what we wanted to really know is, are patients who are 65 years and older at higher risk, uh, when we take into account both high and low volume surgeons, um, across the nation and are the rates that, for example, our surgeons are giving at the University of Michigan when patient, patients ask about what is my likelihood of having hypoparathyroidism, you know, when we say 2%, is that really what's happening across the country? And you can see here that in general, actually, we were really surprised to see that the rates were much higher than expected or what we are used to telling patients in our high volume academic institutions. So overall, 6.5% of patients develop general complications and about 12.3% had thyroid surgery specific complications. That, that's a lot higher than what we had expected to find. And stratifying by age, you can see here, that definitely patients who were 65, uh, older than 65, had much higher complication rates than those younger, and some of them reaching up to 20%. And similarly, when we looked at comorbidities, you can see that patients with multiple comorbidities uh, also had a higher rates of complications when controlling for uh, other risk factors. So just something to think about um, in terms of where your patient uh, will be getting treated. Not everybody has access to high volume surgeons or um, multidisciplinary endocrine oncology care. So, so what have we learned? So uh, in general, we should think that um, imaging-based risk stratification for thyroid nodules alone may not be effective for detecting clinically significant disease. So think uh, before you act because uh, usually doing an FNA creates a cascade of things and may lead to downstream consequences such as unnecessary surgery with um, associated morbidities, patient anxiety, et cetera. Um, we should be thinking about integrating other risk factors, such as, for example, patient age in decision making, but thinking also that not all 80 year olds are equal uh, when discussing risk of malignancy. And there's definitely other factors that play when uh, we discuss, um, discuss these issues with older adults. But on the flip side, uh, we should be vigilant to recognize promptly potentially fatal thyroid cancer. <clears throat> so as in Trevor's study, even though those were few patients, um, we don't wanna miss them. So I think that we do still need some improved methods of risk stratification to identify those who would benefit most from immediate FNA and ultimately surgery, uh, but also avoiding overdiagnosis and overtreatment, which could lead to uh, harm. And again, you know, as I've showed, it's possible that effectiveness of the guidelines could be hampered by some inter varied interpretations of the sonographic classification of thyroid nodules. So just some things that are in my mind that I can put out there for discussion. 
Uh, so just because the actual FNA biopsy procedure is safe, should we be pursuing this in all older adults with thyroid nodules that are meeting criteria? Um, I don't think so. Should we only be pursuing FNA biopsy in those older adults with sonographically intermediate or high risk nodules? Should we be considering non-surgical minimally invasive procedures such as RFA and or ethanol ablation more often in older adults if they are appropriate? Uh, and we definitely do need to develop multivariable diagnostic algorithms that incorporate um, additional risk factors in addition to sonographic characteristics when we think about thyroid nodules. So this is the case presentation that was uh, originally put up by Trevor. So I'm going to leave it out here. And I think um, there's going to be a poll now to see whether the answers have changed. Great. I think uh, I think our um, if I look at the responses before and after, I do think there has been a significant change here um, in terms of how the attendees responded to this question. Um, I would encourage uh, some of our attendees to pose questions, um, and they can easily do that by just clicking on the icon. And I um, have two questions for each of you, uh, one of which posed by one of our attendees. Um, Trevor, my first question for you is, how did you arrive at the age of 70? Did you do an analysis for 65 and above or 60 and above? And did that change the the results if, if you did that? or? What was your thought related to that? And also a follow-up to Maria's question regarding how reflective the demographics of your patient population are relative to um, the rest of uh, the country. I, Trevor, I think you may be muted. They helped me out. I told them I couldn't. My my unmute button was non-functional. Uh, so that that was I derived in in our study from two um, things we were thinking of at at that time. One was we were building off of the previous study that that I mentioned and Maria mentioned, in which the sort of um, decadal categories had ended up grouping a 70 and older group. So we had that previous observation in a study in mind, and we're sort of grabbing that cohort and, and moving forward. Um, you know, we, we from a, from a, a priori sort of way, you know, a way of, you know, not related specifically to the data, we, we sort of asked ourselves, what are, what's going to be the most kind of impactful um, data as far as, you know, which are the patients where people have in their mind, you know, maybe this patient is a little older and maybe this patient is is not a, a, as old. You know, we thought, should we just be thinking about patients older than 80 as the, as the ones where clearly uh, we should be maybe thinking about this differently, but but thought that it, you know that was maybe too far on one side. Whereas it, we also didn't want to extend things into a population of clearly sort of still young and vital individuals. So um, it, both from a from the previous data standpoint and a little bit of our own you know intuition, we went at that cutoff. Great. And what about um, in terms of the demographics of your clinic population, how they reflect a, a, a more generalized population of, of individuals in the country? Yeah, so, I, well, one, I want to just, I mean, the, the kind of identification of the limitations is really important. So Maria did a, a good job of that. Um, you know, our, the, the population from the clinic is, 
is relatively general. Um, and I sort of you know, tried to capture that in terms of the baseline demographics. Um, it, and the, the nodules performed, even though we're, that was obviously a tertiary, very academic center, is really the, the only performing um, nodule biopsy uh, site for the entire Brigham system involving, you know, all the outlying primary care uh, locations. So it is relatively generalized um, for uh, an overall care population, at least, you know, in that geographic location. Um, but we could, we certainly we can't exclude that the patients referred for evaluation were um, pre-stratified um, before they reached us, meaning people were only referring certain older patients for evaluation. That's possible. From the standpoint of the, the um, clinical evaluation, you know, it was not the practice to preferentially not biopsy or biopsy um, particular nodules in that particular age group. So from the cohort composition, uh, generally when they had when they were seen in the clinic, we feel like it was a you know a, a good overall representation of the patients that were seen. Okay, terrific. And Maria, um, two questions for you. One is. Um, related to the graph showing increased nodularity with age, and the question really relates to whether you, um, if you could speculate, is this an age phenomenon, and the more years you're alive, the more nodules you're produced, or is this a, a reflection of increasing TSH values um, that tend to rise over time here? If you could maybe um, uh, answer that. So it's an excellent question, and I'm not sure anybody knows the answer. Um, but I think I think uh, a few things to consider. So 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 I, I guess it depends how you think about it. So I think definitely um, TSH does play a role. So there's good literature out there to show that increasing TSH is associated with increased nodularity. And I know you're alluding to the fact that higher TSH in older adults, which has been shown um, in, in population-based data with NHANES-3, there's definitely a, this, a, a right shift in the distribution of TSH with age. So it is possible, it's plausible that that is one of the mechanisms. I'm not sure it's the only mechanism um, or that anybody really knows. Uh, but definitely there's um, there's uh, also increased detection of these nodules in general uh, because of, of imaging techniques. But yeah, I think it's a good point, but I really don't know that anybody knows. I think it is very likely that TSH plays a role. Okay, and I was um, quite surprised to see the statistic of increasing thyroid-specific surgical morbidity in that older age group. I can certainly understand an, a generalized morbidity, surgical morbidity, but hard to reconcile why there would be increased surgical mor um, thyroid-specific surgical morbidity. Do you have any thoughts on that? So we were also surprised <laughs> um, in, in terms of the, the th and it's, it's really hard to know. I think there was uh, definitely some overlap in, um, you know, in older age and number and comorbidities. So I don't know if part of it had to do with things we didn't look at, you know, for example, um, I don't know, obesity or it, things like that. So there was maybe some um, interaction uh, between age and comorbidity uh, when we looked at thyroid surgery specific complications. But I, we were also quite surprised to see that. And I think that's probably uh, a manifestation of um, including the low volume surgeons across the country and not just uh, academic institutions. But uh, you may, I, do you have any thoughts on that? I, we kind of struggled with that as well to explain why uh, in terms of uh, hypoparathyroidism and vocal cord paralysis. 
Um, so that having just operated on an 81 year old yesterday with thyroid cancer, I will say that um, inability to extend the neck um, right. may may be a factor in that, but um, it's certainly something of, of interest to uh, um, to evaluate. I don't I certainly don't know of any data to support increased sensitivity of the recurrent laryngeal nerve to age related right. to manipulation or you or similarly to the par of the parathyroids but certainly inability to extend the neck um, can be can be more of a challenge here mm -hmm. um, one last question from one of our um, uh, attendees was well whether you would consider active surveillance in a healthy 85 year old with a four centimeter Bethesda six nodule um, for both of you uh, sure. So, so one, I, I, I mean, I'll assume Bethesda six. We're talking about papillary uh, thyroid cancer in this case, uh, which pr probably we are. Um, and and I, I, this is one where certainly I would be immediately like split into into what I thought should be done. Um, and and obviously the patient's going to help kind of uh, direct which way you go um, in terms of what maybe they're they're willing or not willing to do um, but I think I think the the overall appearance is is important uh, again going back to the imaging if there is anything that appears higher risk than a well circumscribed into interthyroidal uh, malignancy um, I, I think I would be, you know, b based on size, I'm still more more inclined to do I intervention if the risk seems lower. But um, even if you extended this not to the borderline, but to five centimeters or six centimeters if beyond what is in the ATA guidelines, I would still be strongly thinking about lobectomy. Uh, can I, you know, get away with doing less for this patient? Yeah, so also I think just some discussion to have in terms of goals of care. Uh, I mean, it depends again on, you're, you're saying it's a healthy 85 year old, but um, I, I think this is where shared decision making comes into place. If there's like Trevor said, if there are no vital structures threatened by this nodule to, to discuss, you know, observing versus a surgery. I think our Unfortunately, you know, we're still limited because we don't know how to do active surveillance efficiently in patients in general. Um, you know, how often do you image them if, if you're going to follow them for how long and when do you pull the trigger? So, um, but I agree that um, it, it kind of comes down to personal. Great. Thank you both, Maria, Trevor. That was really um, a terrific uh, um, discussion and certainly food for thought for all of us. I want to thank you both um, for your participation and hope we can call upon you again in the future. And just um, by way of uh, um, next week's Journal Club will be dedicated to the topic of weight changes after thyroid surgery for patients undergoing surgery for both benign and malignant thyroid disease. Um, and Dr. Jeff Mechanic will be uh, serving as discussant. So um, with that, everybody, um, thank you for attending. Um, and again, thank you to our presenters and everybody stay safe and have a great weekend.